Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Council of Elrond. In today's episode we are going to talk about a movie that neither of us had ever seen before until this week, 2019's Tolkien. We'll be talking about what is and isn't accurate, facts from behind the scenes, what some of the symbolism and imagery meant and of course whether or not we actually enjoy the movie itself. I'm Dave and joined with me as per usual is my co-host Johnny. So let's talk Tolkien. I have been fascinated with language. I've invented my own. You invented an entire language? Yes. I made stories. Legends. Tell me a story in any language you want. So before we get into today's episode, we have a couple of shout-outs for some amazing human beings who have signed up to the Hobbit level tier membership on our Buy Me a Coffee account. We set up this very recently and we are delighted that we already have 6 members. So these are the names that appear on the app. So first of all, Hames We just want to say thank you so, so much. Very generous. Then we have at CR15B. The next member we have is Wahefewe. I don't know if I'm pronouncing (laughs) that right, but you know who you are. (laughs) Wahefewe, yeah. I'm not sure how to pronounce that one. The next person we want to thank is Rachel. Uh, After Rachel, we have Leia. So thank you very much, Leia. You the man. And finally, (laughs) we have John Shelton. So... Thank you guys so, so much. We really appreciate all the kind messages as well and the support. And if you want to become a member and give just two or five euros a month or send a one-time donation, our link is buymeacoffee.com forward slash the Melonheads. Or you can check out the link in the podcast info section or on the Twitter or Facebook bio. And by the way, guys, it's called Buy Me A Coffee, but we just want to remind you that we're not actually buying ourselves coffee Every cent we receive is going back into the podcast in terms of recording gear and better podcast hosting websites, etc. So again, a massive thank you to all our supporters and our Hobbit members. So cool to say that. So anyways, on to the episode. Thanks, guys. We just wanted to say that this will be a spoiler review of the Tolkien movie. So if you haven't seen it yet and don't want to hear anything about the movie that is nearly three years old now, first of all, go out and see it and you have been warned. So let's crack on with it. Mm. So Johnny, what was your first initial reaction to the movie after watching it? I really liked it. I don't really watch a lot of period pieces like that are set like a hundred years back or things like that. I, I mean, I... Uh, in terms of movies, I maybe for series, TV series, I've seen things like I really enjoy things like Peaky Blinders or The Crown and things like that. So Pride and Prejudice. I love Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I watched it, it was really nice to just kind of get thrown into that sort of, um, I don't know, that atmosphere. And it's like it's really that era. Uh, yeah, that era, like, I mean, the way that they do it with the costumes and the old cars and the old sets yeah. and especially like, as I said, watching shows like Peaky Blinders or The Crown, I'm always fascinated by how they actually like the logistics of how they actually shoot some of the scenes and it really immerses you well into that like time when they can do that so well with the styles of as i said the huge sets that they obviously have for um restaurants and for whatever streets entire buildings that just look like they're from 100 150 years ago so um that was the first thing for me i just found it really really immersive and i really really enjoyed it and also in terms of the actual movie itself, I thought, I remember before I watched it, I thought it might be a little bit slow paced. It might be a little bit boring at times, but I was really surprised with how quickly it was paced and how there was no time during the movie that I was bored at all. And yeah, I don't know. I thought it was just really, really good. It was very insightful as well. I uh, I didn't know a whole lot about Tolkien's early life. I knew that he was born in South Africa and I knew that I knew about his father's untimely death and but apart from that I didn't really know much about his his early I of course I knew as well he had a strong interest in languages from a young age and I know that I think that was like you know because of his mother but I wasn't Mm. really aware that he was actually like a language virtuoso or anything like that so um in terms of uh what I actually learned about his earlier life I'm not sure to what extent it's all true but I found it really insightful and really enjoyable 
Yeah, cool. And uh, weirdly enough, uh, I wasn't sure how you were going to react because we haven't talked to each other about this since we've watched the movie. Mm. And uh, it's not like we watched it in the same room. We we both live in different countries, so it's not like we just avoided each other for a few days. (laughs) Um, we didn't make eye contact for the last few days. Yeah, yeah, we didn't. We didn't talk to each other. But I, I did my, you like it? In, my initial reaction was actually uh, the opposite. I was a little bit oh, really? disappointed. Yeah. I, well, you see, I when was you say it, when you say your initial reaction, do you mean the, like twenty minutes into the movie, or as soon as the movie finishes, you're thinking back about it, and that's your initial like thought process when you're like considering it? I think afterwards. I think both. I think while uh-huh. I, not twenty minutes into the movie, I think maybe maybe a good like 40 minutes into the movie and I was like okay so this is the kind of movie it's going to be and then at the end I was like okay like I really liked the ending but sure I li- I liked it so much because it was so much better than everything that came before now that th- this is my initial review upon reflection I think my mind has changed a little bit right so so basically did you go into it with the expectation of more I suppose showing you more about where he developed his ideas for the Lord of the Rings and for other writings like the Hobbit or things like that maybe but I I had heard before I think when the movie came out I saw a review of it and they talked about how it doesn't really get into much of that it's more of a love story and like his younger years and it doesn't really touch on lord of the rings and the hobbit that much so Mm. i was expecting that but i but it still wasn't the story and the film i was expecting and I, i thought there would be a lot more of a love story and i didn't really love the love story okay well i i was gonna say that i was expecting when the movie first came out a few years ago i remember thinking First of all, I was like, oh, I really want to see that movie. But then secondly, I was like, I, I, I assume they've just turned it into a Hollywood love story. And mm. that was I thought that was going to be the main focus. But uh, I was, as I said, pleasantly surprised with the, the, the way that it was made. And I, I, thought, yeah. I thought the love story didn't take over. That didn't seem like it was the main thing. I thought that the main concept and the main kind of thing that they wanted to show with this movie was his kind of the whole story of kind of courage and friendship and yeah like fellowship and things like that as yeah well, so. and, and i think that's what they did really well mm. um but i i think my expectation was that it was going to be like a hollywood love story and you're really excited about that yeah <laughs> i was so excited <laughs> yes. no uh, like uh tolkien rom-com <laughs> yeah <laughs> he sees edith for the first time and like playing the piano and whatnot and that's grand but then the next time you see the two of them together they're like already a couple and i was i was kind of wondering where we going to see them meet for the first time properly or you know have little well i don't think they were a couple at that time they lived in the same house because they were like yeah um, but they were boarding they were very coupley i wanted to see like the first interaction of like you know i want the awkwardness and the shame of tolkien but it was just (laughs) he was too good (laughs) tolkien as like an awkward teenager trying to chat up some girl yeah like he was way too suave. How does that make someone like me feel when the biggest nerd in the world was just such a womanizer? like <laughs> La- Ladies man. Such a ladies man. I-, I think to be fair, she was like the only girl and he was like the only guy around the similar <laughs> age in that house. So like that, like they didn't really have many other options. So it's kind of like. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, but but yeah, I do agree with you that it shows great camaraderie between the friends. Uh but I, I did feel like the movie was only telling us a few things about Tolkien's early life, but it didn't really grip me on any of them. And like, I I kind of feel like I didn't really care much for the other members of the TCBS. And oh. like, yeah, they were I, nice. I, I, and I thought, I thought they were good actors and stuff. But like, you know, I never really, it wasn't until the end where I was like, wait, wait which one was Christopher? Which one was, you know, I, I didn't really know who was who. Yeah, well, uh, for me, I always find it difficult when you're introduced suddenly to like three or four characters at the exact same time and you're kind of, and they, they, you hear, this actually happens to be in real life when I go to like a party or if I meet a few people at the same time and I meet like five people and they all tell me their names and I have no idea who is who and at the end, I, I'm like, okay, somebody was called Rebecca, but I, there's like three girls. I'm like, I don't yeah. know which one it is. And so it's That's like, very true. when it happens to me, if I'm watching a movie as well, I, I find it difficult. But I actually, towards the end of the movie, I did I did remember which one was Christopher and I don't remember the other guy's name. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. And I... I actually don't remember the other guy's names either, but <laughs> I, I was like, okay, Christopher, so this is the best friend guy, like he was a bit of an ass at the start and then he becomes like his best friend, but then he wasn't really the best friend at the end, it was, it it was, was that the, other dude. The, the, the poet guy. 
Yeah, exactly. And I was like, well, they didn't really establish that much at the start, but I don't know. It was a little, a little gripe. Also, one one, one small gripe that I may have about the whole uh, that kind of friendship thing that they had. It was like how they went so quickly from being like enemies to being we're now best friends. It, it seemed yeah. like the very first time that that uh, they actually like begrudgingly invited Tolkien to like go out and have tea with them. It was like. Yeah. Right, so after this cup of tea, we've finally gotten to know each other, and now we're going to be best friends forever. We're going to create a brotherhood, and we're going to take yeah. over the world with our love of poetry and art. And I was like, is, "This is you guys, you're kind of rushing it a little bit. Like, just give us a couple more scenes of." Uh, I I did think them. that at the time, but I I was thinking like, "Look, the movie's just going to be really fast paced now." So correct, I exactly, yeah, yeah. Just in terms of pacing, you can't have, you can't win them all. And again, I'm not going to get hung up on small details like that. Obviously, it's nice to see. What was their initial reaction? Uh, obviously, they're young kids. Kids are cruel. They're going to hmm. have a gripe with the new kid on the block. And then eventually they overcome that. They become friends and they become like brothers, I suppose. So yeah. it was a little bit quick, but they don't have a lot of time in movies to show this. It's not like in a series. Yeah. And like if it was going to be a big, I don't know, franchise of Tolkien movies, they could have had that be a big part of the first movie. Like, you know, in the Harry hmm. Potter movies, like Draco is an asshole for the first like seven movies <laughs> does he become but, good uh not sure who knows who knows um but yeah upon reflection like throughout the week as i was doing research and i was looking into videos and like you know looking into the history behind the movie and all that kind of stuff um i think that it is really a great personal movie and it doesn't like you said earlier it doesn't fall into the usual hollywood movie biopic tropes and love story love story tropes as well but um and the themes of love and fellowship are very obvious just like they are in Tolkien's real works which I thought was a nice little touch and yeah. then also you you mentioned it as well briefly but on a technical level I really enjoyed the cinematography and the acting of course Nicholas Hoult is I, I really like him he's cool yeah he's very good the the little use of CGI was very good because they probably they, mm. you know they didn't have a big budget for this movie so a little bit of it was was just enough. Yeah, I enjoyed that small little touch of it in here and there, and then just yeah. like uh, like just so you can kind of I don't know uh, wet your beak a little bit and kind of like oh exactly. here we go, and then it's like and then they take it away and you're kind of going oh, okay all right I see what you're yeah, doing. You're, you're left wanting more. <laughs> I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. Yeah, and and you're right as well. They obviously spent a lot of money on on sets and you know. Um, old cars and things like that and yeah that's something that always amazes mm. me i'm like how do they have so many like in this one scene alone there's like at least 50 antique cars from the you know 1977 or 1915 or 1916 or whatever mm -hmm. i always wonder yeah. that in movies like where do they get those is it all cgi or what yeah but for me but, um, it's it's like i you know you can understand that obviously they can get their hands on these types of cars from like you know vintage car owners and stuff but mm. When they have scenes like inside a huge restaurant or something, it just all the interior design of the restaurant just looks so like from 100 years ago and those yeah. types of things as well. I'm kind of just like always left a little bit sort of um, gobsmacked. I'm always left a little bit gobsmacked. I'm always left a little bit like a, I don't know, at a loss for words like I am right now. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> like, uh, how do they how do they do that kind of stuff? But also, as you mentioned, the the cinematography as well. Like, yeah, that was a really, really important part of it. The, the, the lighting of the entire movie, I thought was just really kind of, um, I don't know, there were certain parts, like like say, for example, in the Lord of the Rings movies, you know, we've, we've spoken about that scene particularly before where Frodo wakes up in the bed in Rivendell and yeah. it's like, it's got this kind of like warm summer glow kind of in the room and that's like yeah. the light, the lighting has this kind of effect on the way that you feel about what you're watching. And I felt that a few times during this movie as well. I felt like the lighting was just really really cool yeah. i don't know like i'm um, just no you're right especially in the scenes especially at the end when he's like w walking around with his children in the forest yeah it's very like warm and then it's there's the contrast of him being at war and it's just like dull and depressing yeah, exactly exactly just so like a really like the, they've taken the brightness down and i thought they interchanged that really well actually just the scenes of the war and then the scenes of you know his flashbacks i suppose yeah um i thought that was really well cut up in a way so good directing Good directing, yeah. sir. Good job, guys. So we're going to say, job. well done to you. And we have absolutely zero experience. But we're saying, we think yeah. you did a good job. So uh, that's obviously going to be really important for you. Uh, I also have to say that the score from Thomas Newman was also very nice. Very 
romantic and beautiful and it was I thought lovely. it was it was cool that he also did the score for the movie 1917 which I've never seen but it's also a British World War 1 movie so that's just oh, another kind of that's, cool thing. that's a fantastic movie so I didn't know that's I the know, same I'm dying to see it that's the same guy that did the music for both yeah and yeah that's Thomas really Newman cool. fair um, play to him yeah, the music was like uh, music always adds such a important aspect of any movie. So uh, yeah, it, re- it was really really well done as well. And as you said, the the blend of the music and the scenery and the images and the kind of flashbacks all put together well. That's not an easy job to do and to do well. So um, yeah, I would give that five stars. Five stars, well done. Um, did you like the our fellow Irishman Colomini's appearance as the priest? <laughs> uh, what did you think I, of his performance? <laughs> I love Cullen Meany. I, yeah, yeah, me I, he's class. Like he's just such a good actor. Um, yeah, I mean, he did. He did. He played his role perfectly well. And uh, again, it was really cool. I think I kind of felt like they were sort of showing a little bit of like forbidden love, kind of like maybe that was kind of a reflection of maybe Elrond's position on Arwen and, and Aragorn, or maybe even um. Baron and Luthien and this kind of like uh, this love that was like they they wanted to get together but there was a, a fatherly figure or somebody that was kind of like against it and I thought maybe that's kind of what they were again like while I was watching it I was kind of trying to look for parallels with Tolkien's uh, later works and stuff so maybe again maybe I'm reaching a bit when I'm trying to find that but uh, uh, I thought no no that's Col- that's a, that's 100% what what it was really? based on yeah like oh, okay. Tolkien and uh, Edith's relationship was based on or Baron and Luthien was based on their relationship no because, I, I, yeah I, I know that but I wasn't sure if that's yeah. uh, that's any of the reasons why I just I know of course that they've been uh, that they were buried and under their, on their uh, gravestone it says they have the engravings of uh, Baron mm-hmm. and Luthien um, so I thought maybe that could have been a thing and I thought Colomini's character again he plays it really well because he only gets a couple of scenes and initially you you know, you really dislike this character because he's basically telling Tolkien, no, you can't uh, go after that girl and she's not even a Catholic or whatever. And so, yeah. um, and then later on, he you kind of warmed his character and you realize that he's um, he's only got like Tolkien's best interests at heart and he's trying to do his duty as uh, Tolkien's mother asked him to take care of her son. Yeah, he was and, the legal guardian at that point yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly. So I think... I don't know. I think from his small, uh, small appearance in the movie, um, I really enjoyed it. And as I said, I just I enjoy Colin as an actor, and I think he always does a great job. Yeah, me too. Do you know I I drove his car before? Did you? Yeah. Class. For anyone that doesn't know, my job is basically driving cars for rich people in a hotel, like a valet <laughs> valet service. And uh, yeah, he came in. What was it? I think it was a big white Volvo. I don't know the the like the, the exact model or anything, but it was. You said big. You mean like SUV kind of thing? Or? Yeah, yeah, an SUV. Um, but yeah, I met him and he gave me a nice tip. So good man. And I remember at the time as well. I was like, I kind of recognise him, but I don't really know what he's from. And uh, I was talking to our brother Paul, and he was like, "Oh man, he's in like." I don't know, he started naming a bunch of movies that I'd never heard of. And I was like, oh, okay. But now anytime, I feel like I see him all the time now. He's like on ads on TV for Paddy Power. And he's, you know, there's, he's just everywhere now that I know who yeah, he is. He's quite, he's quite, yeah, exactly. He's quite, he's quite a big actor. I think that happens a lot as well in just anything in life. When you hear something for the first time or you hear of a certain thing and you're kind of like, oh, I never even knew about this. And then suddenly after you hear about it once, you just see it all the time. Yeah. I'm in my mum's car. Broom, broom. Get out of my car! So the film suggests that The Lord of the Rings reflected moments and episodes in Tolkien's life, born from references Tolkien collected from his mother, the Catholic Church, the group home he grew up in, his friends at his private school, his unlikely love story with his wife, and the horrific events of World War I. So all these little tie-ins of four boyish, hobbit-like friends embarking on a dark adventure, forming a fellowship... Uh, a quirky Gandalf-like professor who wanders off into the woods mid-sentence. They all feel <laughs> earned, possibly because they're so subtle, like all these little details. It's not it's not an obvious, you know, professor with a big beard and a staff. It's just kind of, oh yeah, I suppose that's where Tolkien might have like looked up to this father figure of a wise man and gone, mm, he could be like mm. Gandalf. And like I said before, the themes of love, friendship and fellowship, they're very noticeable. 
Tolkien was, so to speak, a nerdy outsider as he was born in South Africa and was an orphan by the age of 12. His father died of fever when he was only two and his mother literally worked herself to death in Birmingham, succumbing to type 1 diabetes at the age of 34. The movie shows that Tolkien's upbringing and the stories he read about such as knights, wizards and other mythology shaped his visions of future storytelling and experiencing horrific images at the Battle of the Somme during his formative years twisted and distorted his views on the world. So it's no surprise that he ended up writing a fantasy series about the impending doom of of the world, if if you were to ask me. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't have. You wouldn't have. Uh, I have a quote here as well from Nicholas Holt. Uh, when he was speaking in an interview, he said, He had the most remarkable childhood, the friendships he forged, and the love he found, and then all of that was wiped away by World War I. I really thought about that a lot. The idea that Tolkien lost his core fellowship through the war and we lost everything they would have created. I think it is kind of sad how there are some, like his friends in the TCBS, they're all such... BTS. (laughs) Yeah, BTS. They're all, they they were clearly all such um, artistic geniuses in terms of music and poetry and... Um, writing and it's a shame we've we we lost some great minds and i think in the battle of the sum there was like thirty thousand british died in one day something crazy like that so um it makes you think well yeah one stray bullet and we we could have lost walking as well yeah yeah or he could have he could have died with his trench fever as well which was yeah pretty awful which is yeah back in the day that was something that i get you yeah, and it's it's gross. Do you know what trench fever is? It's basically all the all the lice that infested the trenches and they, they I think the lice had some sort of disease and that's how people got trench fever from like they oh, really? were literally being eaten to death by these lice. Oh. Um yeah, it's gross. Horrible. They are not for eating. I just wanted to ask you as well, do you know what language Tolkien speaks in the scene where he's drunk? Um you remember that scene, yeah? Yeah, I remember the scene. I'm trying to remember what it sounded like when he was speaking. Uh, I don't know. Was it a bit of Kuzdul in there? <laughs> no, there was no Kuzdul. Oh, damn it. Just uh, maybe Sindarin? Yeah, well, it it was actually... It was it was called proto Quenya, so it's not the full language Tolkien invented later, but more a foundation of what was to come. So, so Kenya. It, yeah, or Quenya. Uh, Kenya, Kenya or Quenya, I don't know. Um, and that is a derivative of. Do you remember what language? What real life language? Flemish, not Flemish. Cl- uh, close fi- from like Finnish. Yes, Finnish. Well done. Um, close so, enough. Flemish, yeah. Finnish. <laughs> First time. I lauri elantar lassis surine in yar unotti nar ve ramar alron in yar ve linti yul marvani er miar mar delisimiru variva. The director said. We worked with several language and linguistics experts to design an earlier version of Quenya. Not the language as it exists in Middle Earth, but the first pieces he must have put together. So I think it, it was made up for the movie. Man, but that's such a level of detail that was unnecessary. Yeah, I believe, like. <laughs> yeah but it's it's class. Like it's yeah, I mean, it's very it's very cool. Like, but I mean, imagine you actually are one of the very few people out there that could hear and understand Quenya, and you're watching this movie and. Uh, you're hardly going to... You wouldn't even understand it either. Yeah, yeah, but you're hardly going to hear a fully formed Quenya and say, this is a disgrace. At this age, you wouldn't have had it fully formed. You'd be like, oh, that's cool that they've included that there. But like, they've actually gone a step past that for any of the... uh, For the few people that could actually understand Quenya. But um, that's... Yeah, it's really cool, but it's also like a ridiculous level of of detail. Yeah, you worded that perfectly because... That is the level of detail that they went into, and it's it's really cool. I lo- I appreciate that. Even if I'm not one of the people that understands it, it's just cool to read that fact about it after the fact. That is cool. Yeah. Nerd! So I wanted to ask you as well. What did you think of the battlefield imagery? What do you mean? Do you mean just the battle like field that the imagery in I general, mean, or do you mean like the the like CGI things that were included as well? Or? No, I I mean I yeah sorry I I need to reword that. I mean like the battlefield imagery in terms of like all the all the things he he kind of imagined. Or, yeah, well, 
you know, when there's an explosion and you see like yeah. a face pop out? Well, and th- those kind of things. Yeah, no, I thought it was really, really cool. I really enjoyed it. And I especially like the subtlety of it. I, yes. I enjoyed that it wasn't just a giant dragon to be really obvious. You're kind of going, oh, here's an idea that maybe... So I enjoyed how they kind of kept it quite subtle and they blended like the fire of from an explosion in with like a small dragon shape or they mm. see him and you can see he's like looking out in the distance and he's kind of um maybe hallucinating a little bit and he sees like these kind of like the black riders etc things like that and i thought it was really cool and i'm glad that they didn't go over the top but rather left it a little bit understated i thought that that was um i really enjoyed that part about it and also yeah. i think that they also had some pretty harrowing imagery too with like the like not talking about the the like the dragons and that kind of stuff as well but the scene where he actually um there's like an overhead camera shot and it zooms up and he's like lying in this pit yeah. this like circular pit made up of all these dead bodies and the water is like red with the blood and all that and that like really left quite an impression on me i thought that was like pretty yeah. intense quite as dark well. it was pretty dark and it was cool that they didn't really shy away from showing you these like actual the real uh horrors of war and like the yeah, just the, the 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 terrible tragedy that it was in the Battle of the Somme. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with you there. Um, there was some harrowing images, all right. And I like the way you were saying that the the water was stained by the blood of Rohan. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think my uh, my general like language and uh, my vocabulary has now been changed a lot because of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, it'll soon turn to Quenya. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, like in those uh, like in those memes of uh, be like Gandalf instead of saying like faster you go with haste <laughs> yeah, exactly instead of saying like uh, I'll be there in a couple of days look like look for my coming at look, first look, light of yeah. the fourth day or something like that like instead of saying I'll be there in about I'll be there in four days yeah yeah <laughs> look, look to my coming <laughs> look to my coming yeah I love all that kind of stuff I thought that the location was very much like the the dead marshes like the whole battle of some uh, I think mm. it was supposed to. I think it was supposed to look like the Dead Marshes, but I also thought it looked quite like uh, Mordor as well. Whenever there was like an explosion going off, kind of reminded me of the volcano. Yeah. And, um, there were some. There were some images like that. Actually, I think when they showed Birmingham, uh, when like after Tolkien had moved to Birmingham, it was like really dark and depressing looking, and that was also supposed to look a little bit like Mordor as well. But um, nothing's changed in Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. I've never been to Birmingham, but I'm I've, I've been told it's a lovely place. Birmingham. Yeah. Um but Tolkien always insisted that there was no one-to-one inspiration for the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. Rather, it's more that Tolkien absorbed the mood of the First World War into his writings, the sense of overwhelming darkness and everyday heroism. And I thought it was very clever how they incorporated his imagination mixed with a little bit of fear and just a dash of trench fever to form <laughs> images of spirits and Nazgul and even a Sauron figure. Or did you think it was Morgoth or who was that big? Who did you think that was? Do you remember when... when the big it, face, kind of like the... Do, well, do, do you remember after the face came out of the explosion, Tolkien actually like stands up. It's a real cool image of... It almost looks like he's wearing a cloak because... Well, I think oh, he's wearing a blanket. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and there's a huge, big I don't know. It looks like Sauron or something in front of him, kind of yeah, in like, I mean, shadow and smoke. Probably Morgoth, I suppose. That kind of reminds yeah. me more of. I mean, I mean Sauron as well. We know that like he could take on shapes of being like this huge size as well. But I, from lots of just um, Lord of the Rings uh, art and like fan art and stuff that you see people making, you can all like they always show images of. Uh, Morgoth just being this like just just a, a giant character like, yeah and, uh, just this huge foe and uh, that's always like so cool and I like to think of Morgoth as just being this absolute like ridiculously sized giant so um yeah and and yeah when I was reading about it after like a lot of a lot of people said that it, it, it was Sauron that he was seeing but that was the first thing that jumped to my head was or jumped into my mind was Morgoth I thought it looked really like Morgoth but I don't know that I didn't see any director's cut of um Karakoski talking about who it was so yeah but another of Tolkien's visions shows two knights duel one riding a white horse and the other riding a black one it's a visceral symbol of good versus evil, conveying the grand sense of J.R.R. Tolkien's stories, even if it doesn't have a direct parallel. Uh, also, like you mentioned, the Black Rider 
feels reminiscent of a, a ring rate. So mm. I, again, it's not like specify. I, I like that subtlety as well that it's not like oh here comes some Nazgul and they're not directly taken out of Peter Jackson's uh, version of Lord of the Rings it's just kind of sure. like he's seeing mythological creatures fighting and I think it's pretty yeah cool. yeah no I just I, I really enjoyed it as I said like I think subtlety was the was the winner for me that it kind of like I don't like stuff that's just so like in your face like here and yeah, I like so the fact the nose, that you like... can yeah I like stuff that you can you can see it as well and as you said I could look at it and kind of go, oh, that reminds me of Morgoth. And somebody else can kind of go, oh, I thought it was obviously Sauron. And it's like, yeah. that's cool that you everybody can have a debate about it and say like, oh, well, in my opinion, it was this. And there is, well, maybe there is a right and a wrong. But for me, I'm, I'm, I think that it's cool that if they kind of just leave it as in, there is no exact answer to this. And like in a lot of Tolkien's writings as well, where he said like, mm. who is Tom Bombadil? And like, there's you can have those debates because it's not just uh it's not open and closed it's um uh it's i don't know it's left open to interpretation so um yeah i thought that was i thought that was really cool i enjoyed that That's- also maybe the thing with the with the two trees like the twisting trees that also could have been a parallel for like the the trees of light in like well in the silmarillion as well so I, I, again there was there were hmm. lots of other things that you could kind of look at them and kind yeah. of go oh maybe this is um from maybe this is something to do with that but it wasn't so much like obviously in your face as you said yeah. on the nose so, it was just uh, like a good. panned camera shot on a tree and you could take that for whatever it could be it could be ents it could be tolkien being one of the elves talking to the trees which he mm-hmm. seemed to do a lot um <laughs> but yeah like you're right most of the film has like subtle touches and just when you were speaking about it there i was trying to think of anything that is really on the nose and definitely the fact when the the boys from the TBCS go, we're kind of like a fellowship, a and fellowship. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was near enough to start. So I was thinking, oh, here we go. It's going to be one of those movies where we're like, was it? Was that? I'm trying. Was that near the start? Yeah, it was when there were still boys. Like, all oh, right, yeah, maybe. It's been about a week since I've seen this movie. I'm actually like trying to. It's, I'm struggling to remember certain parts of it. Like, yeah, uh, this movie definitely needs a rewatch. I think. Yeah, I might watch it again because I really enjoyed it. But uh, yeah, little things like that. And I don't mind if like the young boys use the word fellowship because no, no. it was probably like a, a common part of their vocabulary from, from back then. Like, you know, maybe fellowship yeah. isn't a word that I would use with my friends nowadays, but like. Yeah. And, you know, just at the time, I remember thinking, oh, this is going to be one of those movies now where like at one point, like Tolkien's going to put on a bunch of jewelry and being like. I am the Lord of the Rings or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just thought it was going down that path, but yeah, uh, yeah. thankfully everything else was quite subtle after it. Yeah. Um, one of the most striking scenes in the film shows John Ronald peering over the side of a trench and seeing a vision of a dragon. And I know you said it doesn't like explicitly so- show a big massive dragon, but it is kind of... It kind it of did looks, in that moment, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, but it was. But you were right, though. It is kind of like in the background, and it's like faded, and it's kind of like, is that a dragon or what? And it's um, also like he's hallucinating at the time, basically. Yeah, because of exactly his, because of his um, fever. So, and and it gradu- it gradually just morphed into German soldiers using fl- flamethrowers as well. So that was kind of it was oh, almost yeah. like he he's got a bang in the head. And wow, the, that was a cool scene. Yeah. Yeah. So the director, Karakoski, has confirmed that this isn't intended to foreshadow smog. It would be years before Tolkien came up with that creature. Rather, it points to the author's long standing preoccupation with dragons and to the legendary Fafnir, who is a who's a dragon of Norse mythology. So mm. uh in an interview, Karakoski said So the dragon, of course, is Fafnir. It's the story of Fafnir. It's not smog or glowering from the Silmarillion. It's Fafnir. God, he said Fafnir a lot of times there. And <laughs> his mind of a dragon, which is a mythological creature that represents your biggest fear. In this case, it's losing your friends and losing your love. So he's confronting his biggest fear in that world. You have to go into the emotions, into what the character is feeling. And in the emotion he sees, because he has the mind of a genius, inspiration and elements, sketches of a painting that he later uses. It works, hopefully, because it's intertwined with the emotion he's feeling and isn't just a fantasy element in an action sequence. And I think we cool. just discussed that and he's right. It was cool just to see a little a little sprinkle of uh mythos in oh, in the battle. What was he what was he faffing on about there? <laughs> what was he faffnearing about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he did use Fafnir an awful lot <laughs> in that first like sentence or two. 
<laughs> so the story is, of course, Fafnir. Fafnir is the story. It's Fafnir the dragon. <laughs> it was near Faf. Yeah. <laughs> near. Uh, very good. <laughs> Faf. Uh, I wanted to ask you as well, was there enough imagery and Lord of the Rings Easter eggs to keep you interested? I think so. Like, was there enough things in it that you were like, ah, cool. I mean, I wasn't watching the movie from that perspective. I wasn't going into yeah. it kind of going, I want to see like uh, subtle nods to this or that or whatever. I was kind of like, I wanted to watch it as a, I don't know, I, I, was, I was left really satisfied with um, the movie itself, the, the way that they told the story and the kind of, as I said, for me, subtlety was the, was the thing that really... Um, it was the aim of the game. It was the aim of the game, but it was the winner for me. It was like, that's mm. what I really enjoyed that about the movie, that they had these very small, subtle little, and as we said before, maybe they weren't even real things. Maybe it was hallucinations, but that kind of was just a small little, like, here you go. Here, yeah. have a bit. It's just like a small little Easter egg. But apart from that, I liked that the main thing about it was kind of like, as we said, the fellowship, courage that was shown, um, maybe some of the relationships, like the relationship between him and uh, his, his wife, Edith, and then him and the relationship between... Uh, Colomini's character as a priest and uh, his relationship with his uh, with his comrades, with his friends and all that kind of stuff as well. So I thought that that was really, really cool. And I think I like that they made a compelling story about his youth without yeah. taking too much from his later writings. And yeah. the most direct Lord of the Rings comment was the final shot from the movie when he was finally about to write The, the Hobbit. And so up until that moment, they hadn't really said anything extremely obvious. As you said, maybe using the word fellowship was a little bit like uh on the nose maybe obvious but uh i didn't think it was too bad but then like at the very very end when he finally sits down and writes that sentence like uh in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit and i thought that that was a cool way to like finish the movie saying like Mm. here's all of his life story and now we all kind of know what's going to happen from here on out and um but yeah as i said like uh in the battle sequence they showed us moments from where tolkien possibly drew on his time as inspiration, fear that he felt, and he used that in describing dragons and other foul creatures later on in his writings. But um, yeah. of course, also, we know that Tolkien hated allegory, and he stated many times that Lord of the Rings was not a metaphor. Um, so some people could be forgiven for thinking that the whole story was a metaphoric way of explaining the horrors of war. But as he said many times, that that was not the case. And However, that doesn't mean that he didn't draw on these moments and yeah. experiences for inspiration. Yeah, of course. And after all, not every writer has had so many close experiences with death, uh, like with for him among his parents, his best friends. So it would obviously mm. be natural for those feelings to come across in his writing. And I think that they did that very well. Yeah. And it, it, it was great that it wasn't a, a sellout of a movie. They could have easily gone for his later life uh I, like Tolkien as a professor but mm. it, it was very interesting that they went for his younger years before he got into what he's most known for uh his actual writing it was all about like him becoming well becoming part of a fellowship and having friends and falling yeah. in love and all that kind of stuff so yeah no I, I really liked I really liked the way they went about this movie um yeah and yeah initially i think it was because i was watching it with my girlfriend and she only knows tolkien from the amount of times i talk about him and being the (laughs) the author of the lord of the rings so i was kind of almost you know i kind of wanted a little bit more uh easter eggs just for her because you know for her to enjoy the movie a little bit but i was kind of enjoying it in my own way but then at the end she said that she loved it yeah i I, th- I think as a movie just in its own right i think it totally stands up as a movie as an enjoyable yeah. like a uh, building of a character and um just relationships and things like that as well i thought as i said i didn't go into it saying i need to see certain numbers of easter eggs and little like yeah. uh, oh this obviously led to the creation of this character or whatever i think i just said i wanted to see a movie that was like done well done with detail and can kind of leave you afterwards with a sense of i think i got to know this character a bit better now and also yeah. maybe i can feel myself where he got his inspiration to create some of his later characters but it wasn't so much like here guys obviously this exact moment here represents this yeah. exact character so i like that about it it was kind yeah of, me too yeah and i think they marketed the movie a little bit the opposite of the way the movie came out because in the trailer you know even the way it says tolkien 
it shows the O in his name like flashing through the screen With like, like a, a ring. ring. Yeah, yeah. And then it pops up like Tolkien and then it shows, I think it shows nearly every single piece of Battle of the Somme imagery of all like the face and yeah, the Morgoth yeah. and the knights. And it shows like, I think they say the word fellowship in it and it shows him like battling with swords uh, with the kids when he was younger. Um, so they marketed it that way, but then they had a nice movie and a nice story to tell. But I'm, I also must add that about 10 minutes into the movie, I turned to Egla, my girlfriend, and I said, I bet the end of this movie will be Tolkien writing in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. And I was like, I, Just mark my words. <laughs> I, I said the exact same thing to my girlfriend when we were watching it. I said the exact same thing. I said, I guarantee the last thing that we're going to see in this movie is Tolkien writing. Yeah. Uh, that's and I loved it. Exactly. And I loved it. I would have been disappointed if it was any other way. <laughs> me too. Me too. Yeah, no, for me, I... Because I, I, as, as I said, when... When you watch the first few minutes of the movie, you realize, ah, oh, it's going to be this kind of a movie. Mm. Because I didn't really watch, I don't like watching trailers. I don't like kind of building myself up to think that a movie is going to be a certain way before I watch it. So yeah. very often when I, if I want to see a movie, I'll, I'll actually try and avoid the trailers because I don't yeah. want to go in with any sort of preconceived ideas. So I didn't really watch any trailers for this movie either. I went in and I saw, as I said, the first 10, 15 minutes and I realized what kind of movie it was going to be. And then I remember saying, Oh, it'd be really cool if they just built like built the whole story up and then they finish it with his like the beginning of his most important moment of his life. Yeah, which is writing that sentence. They could have even done a sequel. However, I think it's kind of a famous moment in his life when he wrote that sentence, and uh, yeah. they didn't they didn't play it out the same way that it actually happened. Do you know? Can you tell me I, the difference of? I thought, I thought it was. That's what. That's why I, I was kind of happy with it because from what I remember, Tolkien literally just wrote that without like thinking about anything before he just wrote in a hole in the ground there lived and then made up the word a hobbit and then just went from there no of course of course but basically i think in the movie what they showed was that he went into this room and kind of locked locked himself into the room and his his intention was to go into try and do some like personal writing but i believe that the true story of when he wrote that sentence was he was uh grading papers and he was like, he'd been grading papers oh, right, for hours. Okay. And his brain, he was just like so sick of grading papers. And he said, uh, uh, during that moment, he just like reached over, grabbed a piece of paper and on that piece of paper, just scribbled the sentence uh, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. And that was it. And then he just put it aside and continued grading papers. And it was kind of like this weird, like, I don't know, brain fart in the middle of grading papers that had nothing to do with anything. And the yeah. word hobbit didn't even make sense in that time. But he just wrote that and then went back to grading his papers. And then later on, like looked back and, and saw that again and was like, oh, maybe I could... Uh, make something out of this that's mad but uh so i think that was like well i mean pff, i mean that's such a minor thing but much uh, of a muchness yeah it's still mm, good yeah and as 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 we both obviously as we both obviously said it was uh that was our maybe what we thought was going to happen and we were both right with that so uh and also dave and i we haven't spoken to each other since we've seen this movie so uh that's 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 cool that we both predicted that well yeah so, um, good job to you good job to you sir finally before we finish i just have a a couple, not too many. What what do I have? Like four facts. So let's get into it. So the first thing is Lily Collins, who played Edith in the movie. She's actually the daughter of none other than Phil Collins himself, which I what? thought was really cool. Really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no way. I can feel it coming <laughs> in the air tonight. And on a, on, on, a, on a side note... Edith or Lily Collins was actually the inspiration behind the Tarzan soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to uh, know. <laughs> can you show, show me? me. <laughs> um, she uh, actually also auditioned for the role of Tauriel in The Desolation of Smog, which I thought was pretty cool. So she had a Tolkien oh, connection right. before. There you go. Very cool. Also, uh, so the Nazgul's cry was inspired by the sound of artillery bombardments and the movie focuses in on a moment when shells fall around Tolkien who is left reeling with horror. I want to read a quote of Tolkien's describing the Nazgul here. Even the stout-hearted would fling themselves to the ground as the hidden menace passes over them or they would stand, letting their weapons fall from nerveless hands while into the mines a blackness came and they thought no more of war but only of hiding and crawling and of death. Every time I read that quote, I, wow. I like I kind of shiver. It's very cool. Um, That's and I very, think the, very cool. the film really did a good job of depicting that. So Yeah, because we, we, we haven't spoken about it much on this podcast before. We haven't spoken too much about the Nazgul, but apparently 
uh, their main and their strongest power was uh, the fear that they would evoke fear. in yeah. other people. And Tolkien has said that if you were able to stand up to a Nazgul and not be afraid, he would have no power over you. And so it's not like he had, yeah. it's not like that was just one of his many powers. And also he was able to, they were able to do other things. It was basically, if you didn't fear them, they were powerless. Mm. And so, uh, and do you know now, what that's exactly like as well? What? The Death Eaters in Harry Potter. That's the exact same thing. Like they're oh, really? they even, they look like Nazgul, but their whole thing is feeding on fear and I think that's what it is. They're, they like suck the soul out of you. And if you're scared of them, but then eventually like Harry just does not fear them or I don't know, something like that. Correct me if I'm wrong, Harry Potter fans. I hope the Tolkien estate got paid like <laughs> royalties for those <laughs> Harry Potter things because it's such a clear rip off. <laughs> yeah, they're still cool though. I like them. Interestingly, while the Battle of the Somme may not have directly inspired Smog in The Hobbit, most scholars believe it was the direct inspiration for the fall of Gondolin. In that story, the Dark Lord Morgoth besieges the elven city of Gondolin with huge destructive machines in the form of serpents and dragons, akin to the tanks and flamethrowers of the First World War. That's really cool. And again, like that could obviously be exactly the case as well. But as we've said a few times before, um, it was cool how they left it kind of up to the viewer's discretion or up to the viewers kind of yeah. uh, own imagination in that moment it wasn't like hey this is exactly this and so um i mean yeah. if, if it was if the director of the movie uh had something exact in mind i also think that it's cool that he didn't play it out that way and he kind of mm. left it quite subtle so um, yeah. well this would be more this would be more before the movie came out as well like i we, we did speak about it in the parallels episode where tolkien m- like a lot of scholars do believe that he was inspired um, by the, sorry, he was inspired by the Battle of Somme for the city of Gondolin with the flamethrowers. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about the movie. Maybe the director added them in for this reason, but like because of the like huge artillery machines that were used in the war, it really uh, kind of, okay. you know, brought about his idea of dragons being used in warfare and this kind of sure. thing. Um, right. But yeah, look, it's all, It's all up for debate, I suppose. Mm, And finally, did you know, this is a weird one, that Tolkien was actually bitten by a giant baboon spider as an infant when he was living in Africa. And some people believe this was his inspiration for Shelob later down the road. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I don't know about that, but that's a What the hell is a baboon spider? Yeah, yeah, I think that, yeah, again, some people believe that's that's never a good way to start out like a a fact, I think, but... um, what the hell is a baboon spider? Now, I don't know a if... spider with a big red arse. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know is this like coincidence or what, but I looked up uh, on Google Images what a baboon spider was and he looks quite similar to, from what I remember, what Peter Jackson was using for his um, inspiration for Shelob. I, I think I remember the spiders that they were going off for Shelob. Now, I didn't actually look up was there a connection there, but I think they do look the same. It's basically a big massive tarantula with like mm. white parts on it as well um gross. you know one of these gross african spiders but yeah there you go that's uh that's where she may or probably not came from <laughs> <laughs> may or may not but probably definitely not yes <laughs> no we don't know we don't know but that's a uh what's the story with those spiders are they like poisonous did he suffer like uh, adverse effects from getting bitten by one or do you have any idea I don't know, <laughs> but he was, an in- <laughs> he was an infant, so he survived. So I'm guessing they're not too bad. Um, yeah, fair but right. I don't know. If anyone has a pet baboon spider, let us know. Let it bite you and tell us how you feel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you die, get your parents to send in a picture, please. We'd love mm. to see it. The wealth of Moria was not in gold or jewels, but Israel. Right, so Johnny, we have a question for the podcast from at Brian Fitz on Instagram. He asks, how the hell does Gandalf keep getting his broken staffs replaced? The grey after Saruman <laughs> takes it and the white after the Witch King breaks it. So, Oh, I like that it rhymes there. Yeah. Was, it a, was that on purpose, Brian? <laughs> uh, you never know. Yeah. I like maybe <laughs> Brian's got a poetic streak. Um. Good question. It's a very good question. Um, 
Now, so he says he says here, uh, like, how does he keep getting them replaced? So he's talking about the gray. So Ga- Gandalf the gray when Saruman takes it, and then he says, and Gandalf the white after the Witch King breaks it. Right. Well, okay. So there's different ways that I can answer this question. The yeah. first way would be so the the uh, what he didn't mention there was the time where Gandalf uh, loses his staff in Moria. Uh, obviously, in the movie, we see that he falls from the bridge of Khazad-dûm and he falls down. He catches Glamdring his sword and he continues on to battle. And then he obviously gets killed eventually by the Balrog and mm-hmm. dies and then comes back as Gandalf the White. That is the only moment that is actually true to the book. That's the only time he actually loses his staff in the books. So I could maybe give you the movie version where I could be, I'm just, I would just be speculating. But for example, in the books, um, when when Gandalf first Gandalf the Grey gets imprisoned by Saruman, he never takes his staff. It, it, there's no mention of that. There's no wizard battle where we see uh, yeah. Saruman grabbing his staff and using like going like two staffs against against Gandalf and all that kind of thing. That never happened in the books. And so in the books, it just basically says that Gandalf was led away and imprisoned on the pinnacle of Orthanc. So. They and also from we've I've seen some uh some fan art from people from like way like way back in the day, like a long time before the movies came out, and some people were like doing different fan art. And there's one guy who's I can't remember his name, but he's famous for doing a lot of Tolkien works, and he showed images of like Gandalf on the back of Gwei here, the eagle, flying away from Saruman's tower, holding his staff. Yeah. And so obviously before the movies came out, nobody thought that he'd lost his staff at that point. So that would be my answer for the gray. Mm-hmm. And then the other one that he asks um, where his staff is broken by the Witch King. Well, I believe we've spoken about that before in another podcast where that's again another change from the books. Uh, mm. And in the in the books, again, that never happens. Gandalf and the Witch King do come face to face at one point when the Witch King is trying to enter uh, Minas Tirith and Gandalf is on the back of Shadowfax and basically that's when Rohan arrive and uh, Witch King gets taken away to go try and face Thed and, and Gandalf does not get thrown from Shadowfax and the Witch King certainly does not break his staff. So yeah. so yeah, so basically my answer to this question would be that uh, there's one moment in the book where Gandalf loses his staff when he dies and he falls in Moria. And actually we don't see that happening the same way in the movie either, that what actually happens in the movie is that when Gandalf shatters the bridge of Casa Doom, in that moment, his staff shatters also. And so his yeah. he loses his staff, breaking the bridge. And then he gets given a new staff um, when he returns as Gandalf the White. He gets given that when he goes to Lothlorien and Galadriel gives him his white clothes and she gives him a new staff. So, yeah. Yeah. Hope you're... that answers the question quite well. Yeah, you, you've, you've hit the all the main... Of my head. <laughs> you've hit all the main points, yeah. Um and yeah, we we had talked about that before, like n- not in a podcast. We've uh, in one of our many nerdy Lord of the Rings conversations, we've talked so about. So when Dave, the- when Dave and I aren't <laughs> doing podcasts, we're having normal conversations about Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, but but then after this question, I did do a little bit of research, and you're correct on oh, all the book you know? lore. I did a little a little bit of research Ooh, there, and the um, yeah, you're correct on all the book lore stuff. But like, if we're just going off um, Jackson's you know con- continuity mm. uh saruman captures gandalf and takes his staff he then escapes without it but shows up later in rivendell holding the staff but even though i've never noticed can it, can i say something before you say it i think i might know what you're going to say that what? we can see that it's a different staff because the shape is slightly different because also in his first staff that was the one where he could uh store his pipe on the top of it and had this kind of like yeah. wave like thing and then the second one that we see when he's in moria He's got that little space on the top where he can where he can like get the light from and stuff. So we could we we could we could safely assume that those are different staffs. Yeah, more than safely. Like the staff is actually a different staff altogether. And mm. in some lovely nerdy websites and fan forums, I was looking through. Uh, it, it, it's not just a movie plot hole, but Gandalf actually inherited his staff from Radagast the Brown. And if you look oh. closely at the crown of the staff. 
The shape of the shaft and the symbol plastered onto the staff is clear to the viewer that the first staff Gandalf wields in the Fellowship of the Ring is the staff of Radagast the Brown. And actually in the Hobbit movies, Radagast's staff, you can see it, is is like Gandalf's staff from the, the start of the Fellowship. But, well, it's so like you a mean more... The, you mean the, the one that he loses when he gets caught by Saruman, that one is Radagast's one. Yes, but it's but when you see it in the Hobbit movie, it's like... It looks more like, let's say, branches of a tree are kind of coming out further. But then Gandalf's version is just like more kind of kind of battered down over time. And you kind of kind of filed it down a bit. You filed it down or yeah, just kind of wore down over time. Yeah. So that's the one with the pipe. Then he is seen with Radagast's staff until he loses it. After his duel with Saruman and Orthanc, he acquired a slightly different looking staff in Imladris, which is Rivendell, that he... That, that held a powerful crystal which he illuminated in the mines of moria so there's actually mm-hmm. a little bit of a crystal in his new staff yeah yeah you can see that in the movies yeah but where did you is this like just sort of fan speculation or i, I thought I that mean, at first um i thought that at first when i was looking through fan forums but i don't know where it says it in the book or where it says it in what books but they maybe it's just peter jackson's version of Gandalf and he actually yeah. put in the time and the detail like the the staff that he uses there's actually so many different staff props you can look them all up on online there's the one he had in the first Hobbit movie and then in the second one it's like whittled down a bit and then the third one it's like even changed slightly again then it like blends into the fellowship one and then the second half of the fellowship is a different staff and yeah mm. no it's cool um yeah it is cool yeah no it is cool and it's cool that maybe that uh, obviously Peter Jackson didn't try to just make him have the exact same staff so that, you know, because then you people could be people could see that this is maybe a plot hole that doesn't yeah. make sense. But um, yeah, I mean, if he wanted to have that scene where Saruman takes Gandalf's staff uh, away from him, then I suppose it's important that people have an answer to this sort of question. And it, mm. it's, 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 a, it's a valid question, as we've said before. Obviously, Tolkien's writings are the the most important thing, but I consider Peter Jackson's work to be basically uh, its own type of canon and, yeah um, and, ag- and any- again that's why i absolutely love these movies because they never cease to amaze amaze me with the level of detail that they yeah. put in they could have easily just used the same staff for six exactly. different movies exactly they could have done that and the thing is i think that the fact that they changed the shape of the staff it shows you that this is clearly a new staff that he has got somewhere mm. now we don't know maybe if this is true that he got it in in Ladris or he got it in Rivendell, yeah, or maybe I've seen other people online speculating about it before saying maybe he just made a new staff himself. Yeah. The fact that it's a new looking staff and it looks different, we know that one of these answers has to be the case, and it's not just it's that it's a plot hole and yeah. look, it's the same staff, so obviously that it shouldn't be the case and that should be back with Saruman. So I don't know. I, again, it's one of these things that it's it's left open and we don't need to have every answer for every single thing, but. Uh, yeah. As I said, my intention was to give you the the book answer, which is, uh, yeah. Again, we we've seen that there's reasons why Jackson made some changes and why he allowed Sar- um, the the Witch King to break Gandalf's stuff, maybe just for the reasons of drama or whatever. But in actual fact, that stuff was never broken. Now, is there any any answer? Did you see any answer online about that one? In the, in yeah. The no. So I wanted to say I wanted to speak on um, Gandalf the White. His white staff is broken in the film by the Witch King, and this absolutely does not happen in the book. But for the con- continuity of the movie, Gandalf only fights with his sword thereafter at the Black Gate. But he does show up at the end when departing mm. Middle Earth with the White Staff. So perhaps he had made one, and it's not beyond the realms of possibility that he had one made. Also, that Witch King scene is an extended edition. So perhaps Peter Jackson got a little, maybe not got a little bit confused, but he just, you know. It would have been weird at the end of the movie if Gandalf didn't have a white staff. Sure. Uh, everyone if you, would be like, if you what? never saw... If, yeah, yeah, if, if you, you were just if, seeing it in If you're the in theaters. the cinema watching a theatrical version and uh, you don't see that scene where his staff gets broken and suddenly he's walking around without a staff. Yeah, you and and that one I definitely feel... I, I definitely don't feel as, as bad for because Gandalf's... Gandalf the Grey staff looks like it came from a branch of a tree whereas this one looks like it was yeah. made in a factory. He probably has about hundreds of those staffs like just lying around. Probably just make it out of thin air. Like, yeah, you know, like you know, when he when he went to the Black Gate, he he couldn't access his uh, all his white staffs. But you know, at the end of the movie, you know, he had time to run back to Imladris and yeah. pick up one or yeah. two spares. And he's like, "All oh, right, he's, I know these yeah, aren't invincible now." <laughs> he's got like he opens up his closet and he's just got like 
like 20 outfits that are all the exact same and yeah. 20 staffs and all this kind of stuff it's like when homer 20... simpson opens his closet yeah, like. <laughs> that's exactly what i was that's exactly what i was imagining um or mark zuckerberg yeah or these, kind, these kind of people gray gray t-shirt seen. and jeans exactly i've seen them speaking about that before on people like these kind of people that have uh, such important jobs and they need to make yeah. such important decisions and they've said like... Because they don't want to have the creativity, they don't want to use up creativity in the morning deciding on what to wear. It takes Smart. a tiny bit of their creative like decision if they wake up in the morning and they have to make a creative decision on what to wear. Yeah. The first decision is just going to be made for them so they don't need to decide that. So uh, yeah, smart. But anyways, I hope that answers your question, Brian, and thanks very much for sending it in. So if anyone wants to send in other questions relating to The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, or anything to do with Tolkien and Middle Earth, uh, you can send in your messages into our social media. So we're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and all of the links will be on the info section in the podcast. So thank you very much. Yeah, guys, we'd, lo- we'd love to get any more questions uh and even if it's just something that we can discuss, uh, if you just like to hear us discussing any sort of a certain, it doesn't need to be a why or how question. It could just be like, can you guys speak on this matter? And yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Thank you. It could be a who, it could be a what, it could be a where. <laughs> it could. could be, it could be a, a how come. Oh. Well, guys, that's all from us this week. If you have seen this movie before, what did you think? Were we correct on all the imagery, or did some of it mean something else for you? Also, is there another movie you could recommend both myself and Johnny to watch? We'd love to know what it is. You can let us know by sending us a message on Twitter at melon underscore heads or on Facebook or Instagram. If you are enjoying these podcasts, please help us out by leaving a five-star review on your podcast app of choice. And if you'd like to support us even further, we have a buy me a coffee account. You can search buymeacoffee.com forward slash the melon heads or click the link in the bio. Remember that's melon with two L's. It's quick and easy. You don't even need to set up an account. You can become a monthly supporter or just send us a coffee or two if you appreciate us and think we're doing a good job. Thank you guys as always for listening. See you next week.